Welcome to a special bonus episode of Analyst Insider. I'm Colin, otherwise known as King Smiley with iTero Gaming. As you no doubt noticed, I'm replacing iTero founder Jack J as the host for this episode of Analyst Insider. That's because Jack will be swapping into our guest chair for this special bonus episode. Jack has worked in data analysis in the financial world, esports, and now in bringing data analysis to solo queue. We'll be speaking about his journey and the way it led to the founding of iTero, as well as his future vision for AI and gaming. He also has some unique insights into the way data analysis can be used by everyone, not just professionals. If you're interested in learning more about what we're doing at iTero, getting tips about starting in data analysis and esports, or simply joining a community filled with professional esports analysts, I highly recommend joining the iTero Gaming Discord. The link to join will be in the description of this video. Enjoy the interview. Jack, thank you for joining us for this interview, even though you did have to because you are the founder, but we still appreciate it. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and jump right into our questions. Uh, so the first thing has been you were uh, normally the person on this side of the interview uh, for all of the other Analyst Insider episodes. What was your favorite part about hosting Analyst Insider and doing these interviews? Awesome. Yeah. I, um, and thanks for having me, which seems very weird to say now I'm on, on this side. Uh, but I think it originally all came from the idea that there was very little content in this space. So if you wanted to become an analyst, if you were someone who was trying to break into the field and learn more about it, there really wasn't much to go on. So the reason I originally started it was because I was speaking to analysts informally over Twitter or Discord and asking them these sort of questions that I'm now answer, asking during the interviews. Uh, and in my head, I was thinking, this is really awesome. Why isn't this more publicly available? You know, it'd be something that a lot of people could benefit from. So for me, the thing that I enjoyed the most was actually not the interviewing. It was the part after the interview where people would message me and be like, oh, that was an awesome interview. I really learned a lot from it. Or someone ended up getting a job based on it or learned to learn how to code or use the right API for the first time. Anything like that, tangible stuff about learning how to become an analyst that came off the back of the interview were certainly some of my sort of like key moments. And, and, and the, re the reason I started the interview and certainly um, the most the thing I'm most proud of about these interviews. Great. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background before you came to found iTero. What, what were you up to that led you here? Cool. So um, I originally started off uh, undergrad in mathematical finance, which had very little to do with computer science. So this was, uh, I don't want to age myself too much, but it's about 10 years ago when I was doing my undergraduate degree and they really weren't teaching coding at that time in universities, especially in the UK. Um, so I very much had my grounding in sort of uh, theoretical maths and statistics, as well as some applicable finance modules. I then ended up in a graduate scheme for HSBC, which is one of the big UK and global banks, uh, working actually as a manager. It was a management training scheme designed to help people learn to become future CEOs, etc. cetera. Uh, but I really hated managing um, and ended up doing a placement through the scheme in an analyst team. And the idea was that I was meant to be leading the analyst, but I actually ended up enjoying being an analyst. So uh, transitioned at the end of that scheme to be a full-time analyst uh, where I spent two more years. And then I was coming to sort of the end of my time as an analyst and, I, and then I was looking at the next promotions, but all the promotions within that particular area I was in were very much to do with, um, managing more, having more responsibility in sort of policy and, and, and that sort of decision making. And I was just totally uninterested in it. What I was really interested in was the technical side. At that point, I'd only learned how to use Excel when it comes to sort of technical applicable stuff. So um, I actually went to the US. Uh, I'm originally from the UK and I was visiting my uncle in California and we went to uh, the Computer Science Museum there. And uh, I remember the very first room you walk into, there's like a, a World of Warcraft original server, uh, which is just crazy. I used to be a big WoW player and I saw this kind of like box here about yay big, which had an entire server in it. I was like, that's insane. Um, and also learned more about sort of AI. There was lots of presentations there and sort of stuff talking and explaining about the future of AI. Um, and then we went on a really long hike. I know this sounds like a super long way around, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting way of coming to the conclusion that I came to was I was on a hike and it was like a 10 mile hike and I was on my own kind of, kind of smashing ahead of everyone else. Um, and I had this time to think and I was like, this is 
there's some combination here of AI and gaming that I think is going to be really important in the future and something I could genuinely enjoy. Um, having kind of done my time in, in finance was getting a bit bored of talking about mortgages and, and whatnot. Um, and by the end of that hike, I'd made the decision. I was like, I'm going to be a data scientist at Riot. That was my, that was the job I was aiming for. So I went back to his place and Googled data scientist at Riot and looked at the job requirements. I was like, holy shit, like I don't touch any of these. Uh, it's so technically difficult and ex the amount of experience you need. Um, so I spoke to people at work and I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, obviously telling them, <laughs> I didn't say I want to leave to another company, but I said, I want to become a data scientist. Um, these are the sort of things that I need to learn. So we start, so I started cracking through them. So the first one was learn Python and then learn machine learning and um, did that for about a year whilst working as a data scientist in, in HSBC and found that most jobs that I was applying for required a, a master's or PhD. So actually ended up taking a year out of work to go do a full-time master's uh, in, in the University of Manchester, which is um, well-known because it's the university that... Uh, um, Turing, yeah, Turing went to, who was the code breaker from World War II, um, who kind of like is the father of AI. So it was very cool doing that. Um, and I came back and didn't get a job in gaming, but actually ended up in consulting, uh, which I hated. I spent about a year there. I love the work, but I really hated the whole idea of selling services. It just didn't suit me as a character. Um, and now we come around to, <laughs> to answering the question of, of iTero gaming. Um, so we're at this point, I've got all this experience working in AI uh, consulting and finance. And now I want to try and apply it to gaming. I was struggling to get into Riot. Uh, it's pretty difficult, especially given I was in the UK. Um, but what I was really interested in was esports. So I started building tools and, and whatnot to, to just kind of practice Python and machine learning, but apply it to gaming and esports. And at one point I was like, hey, this is actually pretty cool. Like this stuff I'm doing might actually be valuable. It's pretty high end, the tech that I was using. So I wonder if anyone would like this. So I spoke to a guy who I DM'd on LinkedIn, uh, Kieran Holmes Darby, who was the original founder of XL Esports and was the CEO at the time that I spoke to him. And I was like, hey, listen, I, I have no idea what you guys do as far as data analytics and AI. I have no idea what esports does with AI. Uh, but I have a feeling that I'm going to be pretty good at it. So could I just kind of come and see what you guys are up to? So he brought me along to their uh, headquarters at the time, which was in Twickenham Stadium, which is a rugby stadium in the UK. It was really cool to go there and meet. Um, it wasn't the LEC team, but it was their academy team, as well as their LEC analyst who was there, a guy called uh, Logan, also known as Statbird. Um, so we had a really great day together. Just He taught me everything about kind of the baseline of being an analyst in esports and in the LEC. Uh, and at that point, I went home and handed in my resignation at work in the consultancy. And I was like, hey, this is, I don't know what it is, but there's something here and I'm going to go work it out. Um, and that really began iTero Gaming. And that was January of this year, uh, of last year. So 2022 was when I went full time on it. My original plan was to build stats, analytics, and AI for esports. So I spent six months essentially speaking to people from the LEC, working with people from the LEC uh, sort of unofficially to build tools with the idea of then selling it to their boss. Um, so uh, I don't want to want to name drop too much, but I worked with a couple of people from the LEC who were trying to help me improve these tools so that we as a team could then try and convince their bosses that it would be worth selling. Um, and that was work that worked fine. And I, I think it would have been viable. The problem was that it it didn't pay extremely well because in general the LEC and even the LCS doesn't have a massive budget for analytics so therefore they definitely don't have much of a budget for AI and the sort of more advanced stuff that I was doing uh, so in the end decided this probably isn't financially worth doing the amount of effort I'm putting in to then sell it to one or two teams for very not very much money each season um, just felt kind of awkward to do. Um, so what I ended up doing was thinking, I wonder if we could change some of this tech a little bit and make it useful for people who are sort of um, so, so, solo queue, the, the mass market, as, as we call it. So we did a bit of, of twinkering and, and then we came up with the iTero drafting coach, which was essentially a tool that can analyze solo queue games and predict who's going to win the game based on the draft of the two teams. And then using that, you can calculate what is the best 
uh, champion at, at each part of the draft. So, you know, wherever it's blind picking or wherever you're the last pick, uh, the, the model can essentially work out who, who the best pick is. Um, so we launched that in September with the help of Overwolf. And uh, so far we're at, I think, 80,000 downloads now. So uh, in the sort of short three to four months we've had, it's been awesome. Uh, sorry, I, I can't even remember what the original question was. That was like a massive eight minute tangent of me ranting about my career but hopefully that means we can kind of cover off a lot of stuff in, in one go yeah you'll be relieved to know that you covered the question as well as i think another question for later so good job uh so when when you were were starting out with hsbc and and realized that you didn't want to do management you actually wanted to do this data analysis what what was it that that drew you into that particular that particular field what was it that you liked about that yeah, I think there's a combination of liking things within that realm and not liking things within the other, the other realm, right? Like there's, there's two things at work there. For me, it was the one thing that I've always liked is to be, whether it's a game or a career or a skill, to have something that has a really, really high impossible to reach skill ceiling. That is something that I've always kind of I, I wouldn't spend a long time playing a game that I feel like could be co completed pretty quickly. So a game like League of Legends is perfect because I've been playing for 10 years and I'm still pretty rubbish at the game. Uh, and there's like a huge amount of margin to improve. And that's just something I personally really, really resonate with. It's just whatever whatever it is in my life, I like to do something that's really difficult to, to, to be good at um, because it just feels to me like it's got long-term value then because I know if I commit my whole life to it, I could still not be an expert at it. And that's great. That's just something that, that appeals to me, uh, which sounds like a really fluffy way of answering the question. But what it, what I mean is essentially hard technical skills is something that I've always um, found appealing. So rather than doing the management stuff, which is its own skill set in, uh, in its own right, I actually found the technical coding python or excel stuff really much more appealing in the day-to-day -day job so ended up there uh and were there any lessons that you learned during your career in finance that you think inform the way that you do things at itero now yeah i mean tons tons right because and this isn't just finance this is in general um and it, there's almost um i don't want to stick pieces of advice in this but i'm going to anyway there is a piece of advice here to say that if you are someone who's struggling to break into esports and you're early in your career, it can be useful to do a grounding career elsewhere first, because whatever it is, it doesn't really matter what job you're doing. There are two or three years when you're first starting out, when you recently left university or, or college or whatever you're doing, where you learn a huge amount of what is called soft skills, which are things like how do you manage up, like manage your manager? How do you work as a team? How do you negotiate? All these sort of, um, they're hard to, to exact, uh, sort of exactly measure, but they are incredibly useful. So those skills are something that you pick up anyway. So there's something I learned in finance was just those kind of soft skills. Um, and then the other side is the technical stuff, which is, I mean, really my job in finance was to optimize the price of, uh, products, which is not that different to optimizing which champion you're picking. It's the same question. It's just a different topic, right? It's you in either way, what you're doing is building a model that can predict what will happen if we go up in price and down with price, as far as how many of the things will sell um, and which one of those is optimal. The same way in league, you're saying, if I pick this champion, this stat goes up, but this stat goes down and like, where's that perfect balance? So really it's the same. It's a very similar uh, mathematical problem. Uh, and in turn, in your initial foray into the esports world, was there anything you learned there that you think really informed the way that you handle uh, the solo queue tool? Yeah, I mean, if I had tried building the, so the solo queue tool from scratch, I don't think it'd be half as good. Um, I, I, I don't like uh, name dropping, but it, it, there are so many people within esports who have influenced the architecture of the model to make it what it is today because they are hardcore they want to win right like you speak to a coach or an analyst or a player they they are literally spending 14 hours a day doing whatever it is they need to do in order to win their next game and therefore they don't have a lot of time for wrong answers and that's great if you're trying to improve quickly because i was trying to improve the tool by 
making predictions about games and coming up with recommendations for the pro scene. And I would supply that to a coach or an analyst and say like, hey, this is what the model is coming up with. And they'd be like, not good enough. And I'll, I'll explain to you why. But these are like these three things don't make sense. Like you've, you've told me this is a good champion, but here's the reason why it's not a good champion. And from that, I can then say, okay, right. Like I can turn that answer, that bit of feedback into a new statistic that I then stick in the model. And the next time I come back with feedback, we've covered that point. It's now working. Uh, and the next thing they'll tell me is like, okay, that's working now, but there's another thing you need to do. And it's just constant iterating and improving uh, on the model. So through that process, which lasted around about six to nine months, we were able to make some pretty fast leap forwards in the architecture of the model and how it functions, which means that it's as accurate as it is today. Great. So we're going to move on to some questions from Twitter and Discord. Uh, the first question uh, came from LEC Analyst Noodles, actually, on Twitter. Uh, and it's it's been the burning question. I'm sure it's why most people are watching this interview just waiting for the answer to this one. Why is Ramus so OP? I almost, I almost don't want to answer it just because I don't want to play on the meme. Um, but listen, the, Ramus is actually very strong. And rather than answering why the, what, this question exactly, I'll bring up the topic that originated the whole Ramus joke, which is uh, C9's one of C9's coach, Vega V2, Vega V2, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, did a recording essentially on his stream of him using our tool, the web app version, which looks absolutely dog at the moment. So that was embarrassing enough. But he was using a Smurf account, I think level 31. Um, and he was using it to recommend drafts. And he started off with like a normal team comp and it recommended Ramus within the top five. And he was like, that's weird. There's a lot of AP in their team and it's recommending Ramus. I wonder if I'll switch this champion to AP if it will still recommend Ramos, which it does. So he does that and then it, it kind of goes on. And then by the end of the video, he's got like a five AP team comp and he's like, it's still recommending Ramos. This is insane. So to, to answer the question, I'll say why, why was it recommending Ramos so, so profoundly? And the reason was quite simple. Our model you, has studied million, literally millions and millions of solo queue games to work out who's going to win a draft. And what it's found from that is the single biggest contributing factor to are you going to win the game or not, is how much experience does everyone have on their champions? Now, once you get past sort of like between that 50K to 150K mastery, it doesn't really make a difference. It's not like a massive contributing factor. But if it's, am I first timing it or not? It is, what, it is the single biggest contributing factor. Essentially what I'm saying is if there was a team of five people who've all played their champion at least once versus a team of five people who have never played their champion before and on all other levels they're equal, the team that have at least one game are going to absolutely destroy them. Uh, it is just as simple as that. And really the statistics speak for themselves. Um, so what happened is that the account that uh, Vega was using only had experience on a handful of jungle champions and one of them had to be Ramus. And since he had some experience around us and none on any others on that particular account, it meant that it was high up on the priority list. There's also the second fact that it was slightly lower ELO where Ramus is strong anyway. It has like a 54% win rate at the time. Um, and he, he's not actually a bad champion versus certain AP. Uh, essentially, if your comp doesn't do consistent damage, it doesn't matter if it's AP or AD, they're not going to be able to kill him. Uh, and he has the ability to kill you over time, even though it's slower against AP champs, he can still run you down. Um, so those three factors, the number one thing being obviously the mastery, but those three reasons are why Ramus was suggested uh, in that in that video. So uh, what I got from that was that Ramus is OP and you should always pick him is what I dare to say. So uh, it's good to know that. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, we did also receive a question from uh, Amelia Folklore on Twitter, which I'm sure a lot of people are also wondering. How many dogs do you have? Awesome. Uh, I actually played around this game yesterday and lost it. So uh, that's now statistical proof. You shouldn't pick it. I have um, no dogs myself, actually, in my in my flat. Uh, I've moved out into the city of Cardiff, where I am at the moment. So we're not allowed dogs in the house. But my, my mum, who lives in the country in Wales, uh, has uh, five dogs in total, one of them being this one um 
which is is Bron. But yeah, we have we have five dogs over there, and then my dog, my dad also has uh, two dogs. And I think Colin, this is a, a good time to stick up the Christmas card that you made for me because uh, yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. We just edited the, a, a handful of the dogs together into a Christmas card, which I sent out this year. And uh, we will get some questions from Discord here. Uh, Pepe Tapia, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, wanted to know, you, you've you talked at length in Discord uh, about your vision for uh, a, an AI coach. What do you define as the AI coach and what do you hope to accomplish with it? Yeah, I think actually I'm going to sidebar here and just do a caveat that I think is super important to bring up early doors because this is a contentious point that came up in esports and comes up in solo queue which is an ai coach will never ever ever replace a real coach uh it's it's really as simple as that they are not capable of doing the sort of stuff that a coach does they are almost two different and separate entities one can the ai can inform and improve a coach's perspective but it can't fully replace it. So if I built the best AI I could possibly do over years and years and years and had a really powerful team behind me, um, the product we create would still not be able to provide coaching advice. It's better than having a one-on-one -on -one session with a professional coach. The reason I'm confident in saying that is because most people can't afford to have regular sessions with a coach. And because an AI coach is infinitely scalable, it means that we can actually serve constant coaching for eight hours a day if, if you're so pleased to play that much league uh whilst a coach obviously usually people can only do half an hour hour sessions once a week so although they are similar they are actually one isn't a substitute for the other if if i was to recommend a sort of an improvement strategy to a, a player i would say number one play the game as much as you can don't get any coaching services you just need to understand the game number two Use a coaching tool to get a, a rough understanding of where your weaknesses and strengths are and what you can improve on. And then number three, once you've kind of maxed out the other two and you feel like you've kind of hit another ceiling, that's when you get a, a real life coach. So I just wanted a caveat before I started talking about AI coaching that I don't think one is a substitute for the other. Uh, essentially, the vision is, uh, is pretty simple. Riot are very kind in producing... Uh, or supplying tons and tons of data about the game, about everything that happens, the kills, the positions, the gold, all of that is available. So what we're able to do is take all of that data and study it and send it into a machine and say, which games are people winning? Which games are people losing? Which accounts are climbing and which accounts aren't climbing? And then from that, do what your what AI is, it can do best, which is then to try and work out what are all the different things that are happening here and how are they contributing to those final outcomes of winning, climbing, losing, not climbing. And from that, we're able to build a coaching tool that essentially is able to take any account, study it and say, this is the top three reasons why you are not going to be able to climb this season. If you were to improve on these things, wherever they're a statistic or a kind of an, a concept, you will climb. And then we can kind of statistically prove that because we're allowed, able to look and compare accounts that aren't doing that thing versus accounts that are and say the accounts that are, are climbing better than the accounts that aren't, right? So um, the same with the drafting tool, we can prove that the accounts that follow the recommendation as in take five-star recommendations, which is how we present it in the app versus not doing that are winning more games. So it's kind of hard to debate it unless someone's just not willing to listen. Uh, but we're able to produce this coaching app, or we will be able to this year, that we'll be able to, as a baseline, understand your account, tell you what are the important ways that you can improve as a player. Great. And uh, we also have a couple questions from Twisted Vision in the Discord. Uh, what metrics do you use to judge the performance of your model? Um, it, it, it depends, because the model is actually broken out into multiple parts. The, the, the final part, Usually, uh, let's stay with the drafting model. The, the, the final out way we evaluate it is how many games that, that we studied, that we predicted the result of the game, how many did we get right and how many did we get wrong, which gives you accuracy. And then there's a slightly more complex version called log loss, which I, I recommend people Google rather than me try and explain it. But essentially, rather than doing sort of right or wrong, it's when you say something has a 60% chance of winning, how many of those games are they winning? So. To, to, to give it kind of, uh, to explain it as lightly as possible, 
if I had 100 games and in those games I predicted that those 100 games had a 60% win rate, you would expect them to have 60% win rate. And you compare those two, you know, like the prediction was uh, those 100 games were 60%, the actual was 50, and therefore the difference is kind of that log loss calculation. A bit more complex than that, but uh, I, won't, I won't explain it here. Uh, and this again comes from Twisted Vision in the Discord. If you had to choose one thing that iTerra does better than other tools or that you're most proud of, what would it be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's, I'd love to say accuracy or complexity or, or model architecture or something like that. Uh, but it's impossible for me actually to compare myself to any uh, anyone else attempting this. Um, there are a lot of people who pop up on Twitter and say, I can, I can do this better or I have a model that does this or other apps that do something similar, which claim to have whatever, it's impossible. There's no way of us comparing unless someone was willing to host a, um, some sort of competition where we all took a thousand games and all predicted the results and see who was on top. We can't really do compare and contrast. So there's no point me claiming that I have the highest accuracy because I'm sure everyone else claims they have the highest accuracy as well. Uh, but I will say something that I can claim, which is we have the best explainability, which is I've spent a long time looking at these models and trying to build them in a way in which the reasons, the rationale can be unpicked. So, so a lot of AI is data in, black box, answer. Uh, I spent a lot of time breaking that black box into little segments and then trying to understand that the inside of those segments so that when we run our models, it's not just saying you have a 60% win chance, it's saying you have a 60% win chance. And the biggest reason you have that is because of this, this, and this. And the weaknesses in this draft or your account or whatever are these three. Um, and that means that we have the ability not only to make recommendations, but help players understand those recommendations, which I think is more important, if anything, than just being as accurate as possible. And uh, one last from Twisted Vision in the Discord. If we were to apply iTero to solo queue games, how successful would it be at predicting the outcome of a game just based on the drafts? Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a moving piece. I mean, like every data refresh comes up with a slightly different answer. A lot of it becomes down to um, the 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 meta at the time because there are certain metas that are more stable and predictable than others. So the model may learn something that then changes in a patch, and therefore it moves back. So it's hard to. I don't want to just quote a percentage but we can roughly say that 60 percent accuracy is is sort of baseline where we where we are um higher during certain periods and lower during others same with elo and all the other stuff that kind of comes into it the lower elos are hard to predict because things like smurfs get involved and they can play any champion and still win but in general we just say circa 60 percent, and that kind of gives us a, a rough baseline to work off of and uh, if you do want to get any questions in for any future episodes that we do of Analyst Insider, uh, you can do that by joining the Discord. We will put a link in the description. Uh, you're also welcome to tweet at us on Discord at Itero Gaming or to tweet at Jack on Itero Gaming with any questions you do have. Uh, so what sort of role would you like to see data analysis take in esports in the future? I mean, esports is having a year, right? Uh, 2023 is going to be difficult because... Um, I don't I don't want to repeat points that a lot of people are making elsewhere, but uh, essentially esports has almost been carried by venture capital and venture capital is drying up extremely quickly, especially in this sort of area and this sort of area. I mean, uh, projects that have kind of had a long time to prove that they can make money and still aren't making money um, and don't really have an answer to how they will make money in the future. So if you were to buy a team five years ago you could easily say well you know there's the the sponsorship values are going to go up or own, simply owning a position in a, a franchise league will just always inflate faster than the market so it's always a good investment etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but ultimately this hasn't really come into fruition as much as people thought they would and therefore a lot of the money that was kind of allowing teams to spend millions of pounds on players and staff and locations is is coming to an end um which means there'll be a bit of a transitional period where essentially teams are just gonna have to cut back on everything and i imagine analysts will be the first to go um because if you were to rank your uh requirements you put players obviously and then you would go maybe a coach and then everything else is kind of 
secondary, you don't need it as much. So sadly, 2023 is going to be a bit of a tough time uh, for esports and therefore for analysts in esports. And I know plenty of really good analysts who haven't been able to find a team for this year uh, because of those reasons, or they've had to move part time or they've had to reduce hours or take pay cuts or whatever. Um, however, that isn't necessarily a reflection on the value of analytics. It's more a reflection on the market. And I think that this is just a new baseline. So we'll, things will stabilize over the next year. And then at that point, we can, as analysts and the community of analysts, start to prove the value that we bring. And a lot of that is just going to come down to publicizing. So actually, there isn't, I don't have an answer on which type of work is going to be the one that drives value. But I can say that simply publicizing what we're doing and making it clear that there is value is, is hugely important. And you will see more analysts, especially ones who are still looking for teams, who will then spend their evenings making models or making websites or producing tools. And everyone's like, actually, that's that's really useful. Um, we, need to, we need to get that in. And then from that baseline, we'll start to improve and kind of get back to where we were. And do you have any tips for someone who wants to create their own app using Riot's API? Uh, don't don't compete with me. No, <laughs> um, no. The yeah, the Riot API is something I'm a massive advocate of. I love the fact that Riot do it. They have a great dev team that are really responsive. I know it takes a bit of time to get your questions answered, but it's a free data source that they are giving out to the community and handling themselves. I'm sure at no small cost. Um, so yeah, d definitely. If you are thinking of learning to code or you want to get involved in esports or whatever, the right API is a great place to start. Um, I did do some videos on this channel, which, uh, aim towards people learning the basics of the right API. So you can just start there. Um, our discord, the iTero discord is pretty good as in there's lots of analysts and there's a whole channel dedicated to people learning the right API. So if you wanted just to answer some questions or um get some in inspiration that's the place to go the same with the riot developer discord there's a there's a separate one for that where you can get more technical questions about the discord about the right api itself um, but ultimately it's coming up with something that you think will drive value and usually the best thing to do is create it not as don't think of a website or an app think of what would you do to, to, for your own account, if you were just running it as a script on your computer, like what sort of things do you want to see? And then once you've kind of nailed that down, then start thinking about, do I put it as a website or an app and how do I visualize it and how will it work? But don't start there and work backwards, start at how do I actually build something that's useful? And uh, anyone who's joined us uh, throughout the first 10 episodes of Analytics Insider knows that we, we always ask the same question uh, for our last question. So. Uh, Jack, what is your favorite statistic? Uh, sadly, if you have listened to all of them, this won't be a surprise. Uh, I think I answered the same question a couple of times, but I will I will say it again just to be consistent, uh, which is I wrote an article about this before. It makes one of the biggest differences in the model. It's something that I think professional players are, uh, and coaches overlook, and that is econ. I also call it snowball utility, but it was too difficult to pronounce. So we just stick with eco. It essentially means how good is a champion or player at using gold? So when they are ahead, how often do they win games? When are they behind? How often do they lose games? And um, the best example, the one that I repeat, repeatedly use because it's the, the clearest in the data is if you had Irelia top versus Malphite top, which of those two do you want to fall behind by? 500 gold at five minutes and which of those do you want to go ahead by 500 gold at five minutes you would say i want my mal malphite my orn my malkai to fall behind and i want my irelia or my yasuo or whatever you know to, to get ahead uh, and the reason for that is because certain champions and certain players just have a better toolkit designed at exploiting um either exploiting strengths as in by using gold leads or they're very good at providing value even when they are behind. So someone like Malphite can still all, uh, use an R and still stun people regardless of how far behind he is. Whilst Nirelia going in a thousand gold behind is, is basically useless as a champion. So um, it's something that gets overlooked. It's a big driver in the model as in if you are trying to pick a champion that's getting countered 
by the lane opponent and it has a low eco rating as in if you were picking Irelia into a hard match match up for her the model is going to be like no absolutely do not touch this um the same way if you're blind picking it usually sticks to things like Orn and, and Maokai's and Mundo's because you're always going to provide value um and the pro stuff if you watch pro drafts you will be surprised how often every single person <clears throat> knows that a certain player is in a hard matchup, as in they're they're playing the best top laner in the league, yet they still pick the Jace matchup. And you're like, we we all know you're going behind 300 goals. So please just do your duty and pick a pick a tank. Great. So uh Jack, thank you for joining us for this uh special bonus episode that uh we decided to do. Uh we uh I would ask you if you had any socials you want to plug, but I think we know all your socials. So we'll make sure that uh, all of Jack's socials as well as the Itero socials are listed in the description if you want to follow Jack or Itero Gaming. Keep up with what we're doing here. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before we end? Yeah, Colin, what's, what's your socials? Give them a plug. Uh, uh, at King Smiley Lol. I think it's Twitter, in your, I oh, I'm wrong hand. It's in your little text box there. So uh, we'll, put, <laughs> we'll put a link in there, I'm sure. I think that's the only thing I'm consistently using right now. But uh, follow follow the Itero Twitters, uh, Twitter, TikTok, uh, Instagram, YouTube, everything. This is not an ad, by the way. But yeah, <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Thank Colin. You Appreciate it. you doing it. Have a good day. Thanks for joining us for this special bonus episode of Analyst Insider. If you'd like to catch up on the previous episodes, they're available on YouTube as well as most major podcasting apps. If you're interested in keeping up with iTero or simply joining a community filled with data-minded people in esports, I highly recommend you join the iTero Gaming Discord. The link to join will be in the description of this video. Thank you for joining us.